We've come now to Genesis 38. Genesis 38 is probably the chapter in Genesis which people would least likely want to teach. The subject matter is um, unseemly. The subject matter is embarrassing. And the subject matter is often misunderstood. One thing that we learn, one thing that God is teaching us, one thing that Moses is writing about in Genesis 38 is what happens to a family when you get rid of the godly influence. Joseph was godly. His brothers were not godly. It's embarrassing for ungodly people to have godly people around. It makes them feel worse. It makes them feel bad by comparison when you've got somebody around all the time who's doing the right thing, but you want to do the wrong thing. So at one level, it's a great relief to get rid of him. Then you don't have to feel bad anymore. Then your conscience is not bothered anymore. But what happens when you take away the godly influence in a family or the godly influence in a community, in a society? Well, when you take the good away, the bad is left. And when you take the good away, the bad gets worse. And there's not only a principle of sowing and reaping in Jacob's life, but there's a principle of sowing and reaping in Judah's life. Judah stole his father's son from him. Judah made his father think that his son Joseph was dead. And evidently, that did not bother Judah to do that to his father. Can you imagine having to tell your mother or father that their own child was dead? In 1994, my father died, and I watched him die. I was there in the room with him when he died. It was a terrible experience. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. It's an experience I'll never forget. But do you know what was worse? What was worse was seeing my father's 90-year-old mother arrive in the hospital room 15 minutes after my father died. What was worse was watching my grandmother weep over the body of her firstborn son. That was much, much worse than watching my father die. That's what Judah did to his father. He didn't mind. He didn't mind watching his father weep over the death of his son. Didn't seem to bother him at all. But once we bring wickedness into our life, once we welcome wickedness into our life, we find out that wicked, wickedness is a very poor house guest. If you invite wickedness into your home, here's what you discover. Wickedness will not, will not always stay in the room you want him to stay in. Wickedness will not, only, will not always sleep in his assigned room. He sometimes comes into rooms that you didn't want him to come in. He sometimes lives in places in your house where you didn't think he would live or you didn't want him to live. And that's what happens in Judah's house. That's what happens in Judah's family. That's what happens in Judah's life. Because in chapter 37, Judah makes his father believe that his son Joseph is dead. But in chapter 38, Judah's son dies. Not just one son, but two sons. He can't control this business of fathers discovering that their sons are dead. Judah takes a wife for himself among the Canaanites, and she has a baby a son named Ur, E-R, that's verse 3, chapter 38, 4. She conceived again and bore a son and named him Onan. 
she bore still another son and named him Shelah, and it was in Kizib that she bore him. Now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and named her Tamar. And Ur, who was Judah's firstborn, and many of these things, these things would have happened before they sinned against Joseph. Judah's firstborn was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Isn't that amazing? Verse 7. Judah has a son who's so bad that God has to kill him. Think about that. That's amazing. Now, there was something in the ancient Near East called the Leveret Law of Marriage. And here's what it meant. If your brother is married, and if your brother dies before he has a, a son, then you have a right and a responsibility to be sure that his family doesn't die out. So that means that you spend the night with your sister-in-law, who's now a widow, because her husband, your brother, is dead. And the whole point is to give your brother an heir. That heir will not be biologically your brother's son, but legally it will be your brother's son. Now, what that means is that you get sexual privilege with your sister-in-law. You get sexual pleasure from your sister-in-law. But the point is not the pleasure. The point is to give her a son, which will be the son of your dead brother. Well, what happened is Ur, the brother of Onan, died. Onan then participated in this Leveret marriage law, and he spent the night with his sister-in-law. But he didn't view that as an opportunity to give her a son. He viewed that as an opportunity to have pleasure with no responsibility of bringing a child into the world. And when he did that, God killed him. So now two sons of Judah are dead. It says that uh, Judah said to Onan in verse 8, Go into your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. So it says in verse 9 that he had sex with her, but he stopped the relationship early hoping that she would not get pregnant. When he did that, God killed him. Now, there are some people who misunderstand this and who say that this shows that birth control is wrong and that we should never have sex unless we're willing to have a child. That's not what it teaches. You can make an argument about birth control if you want to, and you can make some good arguments. The Roman Catholics have made arguments against birth control. Maybe some of their arguments are good, but there's no argument against birth control in Genesis 38. It doesn't have anything to do with practicing birth control. It doesn't have anything to do, it's, the passage is not saying it's wrong to try to prevent a pregnancy. It's not saying that. I personally do not believe that birth control is wrong. I believe that that relationship is also for pleasure and not just for having children. There's a whole book about that in the Bible called Song of Solomon. But the fact is, what Onan did was wrong because it wasn't his wife. It was his brother's wife. So the only reason he was given that privilege and that pleasure was to have a child. Therefore, when he took the pleasure but refused the responsibility of bringing a child into the world, he sinned and God killed him. That's what the story is about. It's not a pleasant story. It's, it's, it's not a passage of Scripture that any Bible teacher or preacher would stand up and say, well, today we're going to talk about Genesis 38. I mean, usually the only reason we ever talk about it is 
we have a commitment to teach through the book of Genesis. When we teach through the Genesis, we, the book of Genesis, we come to chapter 38. I don't say, oh, this is so embarrassing, we're going to go straight to chapter 39. No, we teach all the Bible. and We teach chapter 38. And again, it teaches a tremendous lesson. It teaches that Judah has sowed certain things which are bringing a very, very bitter and painful reaping into his life. He tried to bring his father's household into chaos by first killing his brother and then, well, no, let's don't kill him. Let's sell him into slavery in Egypt. We'll never see him again and he'll be just as good as dead. Well, now his own sons actually are dead. Judah committed a great sin, a great sin against his brother, a great sin against his father, and a great sin against God. Now his sons are committing great sins. They're imitating their father, who is an ungodly man. Now, there are other things which happen um, in this family. Um, <clears throat> Tamar is the widow. of Judah's son. And she's a young woman. And she wants to have a husband. And she wants to have a child. She doesn't want to just live as a young widow for the rest of her life. And her, father prom her, her father-in-law promises her that he will give her another one of his sons as a husband whenever one of the brothers becomes old enough. And then, um, <clears throat> and then Judah's own wife dies. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com.